morning, Ontario. To tell you the truth, I'm not even sure what design means. Personally, I have never regarded myself as a designer. I am a graphic communicator because I create big ideas, not designs. Surely, great graphic design is not merely the aesthetic arrangement of lines and shapes. Great graphic design is the transformation of a big idea into an unforgettable image. In this astounding new world of technology, all the tools in the world are meaningless without an essential idea. An artist or advertising person, a doctor, a lawyer, an, ele an electrician, a factory worker, or president without an idea is unarmed. The title design thinker cannot seriously describe the majority of graphic designers in the modern world of communication. And as such, the term design thinker exists as an oxymoron for most. Design thinking should be about getting an idea. Designing is playing with yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> Understand this, if there is no meaning to your work, there is no meaning to your life. Art directors in advertising and in magazine design, all graphic designers, must be communicators. Or they are simply rearrangers of elements in layout or design. An art director must be someone working by, him, by himself or in synergy with a copywriter who treats words with the same reverence they accord graphics because the verbal and visual elements of modern communication are as indivisible as words and music and a song. But be warned, the capability of a computer to produce bells and whistles can never inspire the conception of a big idea. When an original idea springs out of a communicator's head and intuitions, always more important than intellect, the mystical blending or even juxtaposition of copy, concept, and art, whether in print advertising, TV commercials, posters, book design, magazine covers, editorial design, package design, logotypes, or websites, can lead to magic where one in one can indeed be three. When that idea is, is dramatized by a unique image in synergy with words that memorably communicate in a nanosecond, there is always an immediate intellectual and visceral human response. Talent is a blessing many people have, but it can, re but it can remain fallow. It must be nurtured. All dedicated graphic communicators must spend their spare moments drinking in the art created by generations of artists who have been the antenna of human sensibility. Artists who understood the art of their past, but who broke with it according to the needs of their time. I see our role as graphic communicators as precisely that of the revolutionary artist. But our kind of art has nothing to do with putting images on canvas. Our art, our concern should be, must be, with creating images that catch people's eyes, penetrate their minds, warm their hearts, and cause them to act. And additionally, the true great communicator reflects and captures the zeitgeist of the time. Indeed, is mystically ahead of the culture by creating work that transforms the culture. To be confident we can produce successful results as communicators, 
We must believe that creativity can solve almost any problem because the creative act, the defeat of habit by originality, overcomes everything. In a profession that should have no rules, I have three commandments for all to heed. One, reject group grope. You understand what group grope is? That's people bullshitting together. <laughs> Two, reject analysis paralysis. You know what that is? More people bullshitting together. <laughs> and three, to truly produce masterful work, reject con, create icon. Look at my work. Look hard. Everything I do is simply an eye-popping in-your-face idea without the interference of distracting design elements. A big idea that explodes off a page is proof perfect design. This is an ad I did in 1960 when it came out, uh, advertising age, uh, I, I, since, I, since that uh, wrote an editorial against it. I, I still I call them advertising old age now. And they say, well, look at that ad. He says, John is back, Billy coughing. Get up and give him some cold in. There's no photograph. There's no logo. There's no body copy. There's no shot of the bottle. That's not advertising. And they said, how can this George Lois do destroy advertising? Well, the sales went up 800%, and it actually helped change what was going on in American graphic design at that time. The simplicity and the power of talking about what's going on in the culture, you know, with the with male chauvinism rampant, uh, and, and the, the bold graphicness of, of the ad just stunned everybody. This ad says, if, if your Harvey Prober chair wobbles, straighten your floor. And there's a little matchbook cover on the bottom. Uh, gee, I had to get this ad out late one night at Doyle Dane Burnback when I was in, still in my 20s, and uh, I couldn't uh, find a uh, hand model uh, that late at night, so I posted it myself. Uh, Bill Burnback, who was uh, the great revolutionist who changed advertising uh, by starting at uh, Doyle Dane Burnback in the mid 50s, uh, uh, great, great man, came back from vacation and had not seen this ad, and he came down with, with the ad to me and he said, George, uh, you know, I, I, know you're gonna, I know you're destined to be the greatest art director that ever lived, but Ads like this are going to hold you back. I said, why is that, Bill? He said, well, you know, your mind's in the gutter. <laughs> and I said, well, Bill, uh, Kempstrand said they sold uh, more product off that one ad than they, than they sold off uh, you know, a, a, a year's worth of ads. And uh, Women's Wear Daily, where the ad ran, said it was the most uh, responsive ad that uh, ever ran. And he said, uh, George, great fucking ad. Um, I also did this at Doyle Dane Burnback. I, it shocked, it shocked the world. It shocked everybody at Doyle Dane, in fact. Everybody, uh, there was posses that went up to, Doyle, to Bill Burnback and said, gee, what a vulgar ad. You know, it was an ad for uh, a, a, a earwax remover. And uh, I showed the, the barbaric way that people uh, clean their ears. And um, um, they went up in a posse to Bill and said, this young, this young designer, you know, that was meant to be a, an insult, a designer. Um, if, at an ad agency, that's meant to be a, 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 an insult back then. This young designer is doing vulgar work, and Bill, Bill Burnback patted him on the head and said, uh, no, it's probably the best ad that I've seen in the last 20 years. Uh, this was, uh, uh, I left Doyle Dane Burnback in, uh, in uh, the first week of 1960, I started my own ad agency, the second creative agency in the world, and one of the first products was a, 
the first product for a uh, allergy, pro uh, for allergy uh, named it Allarest. You don't have a cold, I don't have a cold. You have an allergy, I have an allergy. That's for Allarest also. The Norg is ugly, but its vinyl hide is beautiful. Uh, there was a product called Norga hide, which is a fake, uh, you know, a, you know a, a, a substitute leather. And uh, uh, they, uh, they had 100% of the market, and uh, a couple of years later, they only had 20% of the market, and everybody jumped in, and they needed something to save their, their, their brand. So I created the Norga. Uh, from, uh, the Norga is ugly, made a doll out of it. And, um, um, the uh, C, the uh, they came back to me. Uh, the client came back to me and said, "Well, you can't, you can't run that ad because people are going to think you're saying that there's a real norga." <laughs> so I, uh, and they said, "No, it's dead." So I went out in the street with the ad, and I showed it to people on 57th Street, Fifth Avenue. You get people there from all over the world. And I said, "Do you think this is a real animal?" And people say, what are you, fucking nuts? You know. <laughs> um, yeah, I got a hundred people telling me I was a screwball for, for thinking that. Went to their seat, went to them, went to their, their, their uh, chairman of the board and, uh, and to prove that, uh, that people don't think the norg is ugly. I mean, you run into that kind of stupidity all the time. Um, <laughs> It's amazing that I was able to sell this ad to Cody. I mean, think about it. I was, I was saying that putting on lipstick and, and making people think you're beautiful is bullshit, you know? Um, because it is, you know? Um, and what was amazing, it was, it was the biggest selling uh, lipstick that Cody ever had in, uh, you know, in, in 100 years of existence. Um, because women, uh, this was 1963, I think, because women appreciated the humor of it. It was a TV commercial also, you know, where Alice Pierce, you know, put, it, put on the lipstick and then there was a, like a werewolf dissolve, you know, remember the werewolf, you know, into uh, Joey Heatherton. Um, 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 but that's edgy, that's edgy advertising. And, 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 you know, you could be edgy, you could be excited, you could be dramatic, you could be unique, but it's got to sell. If it doesn't sell, it's bullshit. Um, this was a campaign for Wolfsburg Vodka. He, uh, you know, you're some tomato, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then he's, he's talking to this to tomato. You got to understand back in the 60s and 70s maybe, and before, uh, a tomato was a chick, was a great looking t tomato. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I was a kid and you saw a woman down the street that was great looking, I'd say, what a tomato, you know? So I said, you're some tomato. And says, I like you, Wolf Smith. I've got taste. You've got taste. And then a week later in Life magazine, this ad ran. And of course, the bottle is now in a phallic position, uh, pointing to the navel. And he, and he makes love to her. And the, and the army says, who was that tomato I saw you with last week? <laughs> uh, the Wolf Smith sales went crazy. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, everybody, every party, every, if anybody bought vodka, if you didn't buy Wolfschmidt, you, you, know, you weren't cool. Um, this was a campaign, basically a TV campaign, where I paired, uh, I got odd couples. I had Whitey Ford, a great Yankee pitcher, talking to Salvador Dali, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and this is a, 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 a Andy Warhol talking to, Sonny Liston, who was the meanest motherfucker that ever lived, you know. <laughs> um, and in fact, I was shooting it, and I said, uh, you know, at a certain point in the commercial, I said, blah, 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 blah. At, at a certain point, Andy was explaining to Sonny, uh, you know, the, 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 the excitement and the drama of a, of a tomato can, blah, 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 blah. You know, Sonny looks at the camera, looks at, looks at him, looks at the camera, like, who is this freak, you know? And, um, and then at that point, Andy said, supposed to say, when you got it, flaunt it. And so we went to, to a take, a terrific, but louder, Andy. 
when you got it, flaunt it. Take three. I like, want to hear it back here. When you got it, flaunt it. Take four. Take 20. When you got it, flaunt it. Okay, two. And everybody's walking around to the set like, oh my God, you know, Lois is never going to get this. So finally, he did, when you got it, flaunt it. I said, terrific, Andy. Everybody, and they, he left. Everybody said, well, you, need, you don't have it. I said, look, I got a gay pal of mine who can do the voiceover. You know? <laughs> and he dubbed it for me. And when Andy had left, he said, oh, I love these commercials. I love what you're doing. I love the one with Salvador Dali, and I love the one with Ethel Merman, and I love this. And this. When you get them all done, can you please send them to me? So I, a week later, I edited them, I sent it to them. And he calls me up and he said, oh, well, we're going crazy down here. We're looking at all these commercials. We love them. Oh, they're all so excited. Blah, 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 blah. And by the way, I said when you got it flaunted better than any of them. <laughs> got it. Um, in 1982, I want my entry was on the, on the air for a year almost a full year without one uh, a cable operator. It was, a, it, was a, it was stillborn. It was dead in the water, done, dipped. And uh, they called me in to, and they, they begged me to do, they wanted me to do advertising to talk to the cable operators and, and trade ads. And I said, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do anything. I said, I, let me go on TV and talk to, talk to rock fans. And they thought, they thought, I, they really thought I was crazy. They said, well, how are you gonna, I said, well, at a certain point on a commercial, I'll do a quick commercial, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of set the standard for the way MTV should look, and the voiceover at the end will say, if you don't get MTV where you live, pick up the phone, dial your local cable operator. And at that point, I said, I'll get Mick Jagger or somebody like that to pick up the phone and say, I want my MTV. And they looked at me like I was crazy. In fact, they were embarrassed for me. They said, no, you, George, we couldn't get a rock star in a million years. They all hate us. They all think MTV will destroy, could destroy the music business. Uh, you know, like, like radio destroyed music back in the 30s. Good luck, they made it. Uh, so uh, they said, uh, and everybody said, no, no, no. And Mick, uh, Bob Pittman, they're all in their 20s. Bob Pittman said, uh, George, look, take a week and try to get somebody. You'll never get anybody and come back with another campaign. I went back to the agency. I called Bill Graham, who I had known when I was working with Bob Dylan, Muhammad Ali, trying to get Ruben Hurricane Carter out of jail. And I called him up and I said, I need, I need a, I explained what I needed. Who do you want? Oh, oh, oh. he said, no, no. no, 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 no. MTV will destroy the uh, music business. Okay, oh, you're a schmuck too. Okay. Uh, yeah, then I talked him into it. Maybe MTV would be great for music. And I said, Who do you want? He said, Mick, uh, I said, Mick Jagger, if I could get him. He can't, I'll give you his phone number. He gives me his phone number in England. I call England. I get Mick Jagger on the phone. He comes month, the next Monday morning, shot the commercial, and MTV uh, uh, did the commercial. He brought Peter Townsend with him and Pat Benatar, unbelievably. Uh, a week later, ran three commercials in San Francisco at, at 10, you know, 11 o'clock at night, 12, 1 in the morning. And uh, 5.30 in the morning in New, in New York, 8.30 in the morning in New York, it was 5.30 in San Francisco, cable operator called up and said, get that fucking commercial off the air. And Bob Pittman said, I'll take it off right away. Uh, and he said, by the way, Pittman, I'll take it. He said, you'll take what? He said, I'll take MTV. Why? He said, because there are thousands of phone calls on the people, uh, people calling me. And that's what happened when MTV, within six months, you know, they, they captured, uh, you, know, you know, they had 90% of the cable operators and, they, and there was an incredible force. Um, th th that's called, that's called do, make, making mar mar marketing miracles. When something's dead in the water and you can change the culture with advertising, that's what it's all about. That's what the thrill of being a designer is all about. You know, being a, being a design thinker. Um, this was a poster for the 
chess championship, and uh, the Russian Federation came to me, and they wanted me to do a posting because they, 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 they knew all about me in Russia, blah, blah, blah. And I, I showed it to the, uh, the, the group of people. Kasparov wasn't there yet, you know, the, the greatest chess player that ever lived. And uh, they looked at it, and they said, yeah, I said, uh, do, you, do you see anything there? I said, yeah, it, it's, it's like a, a Russian constructivist design. I, we understand. No, no, do you see what's between Karpov and, Kar and Kasparov? They said, no. <laughs> and I, I, I said, you look schmuck, you know. It, uh, <laughs> said, oh, oh, a chess piece, oh. Well, listen, Kas Gary will not see that. Gary Kasparov won't see that? The guy can, can play 30 games blindfolded and win. They said, no, no, you got to do another one. Anyway, I refused. The next morning, Kasparov came in. And I went out, and I, I they just held it up and showed it to him. And he leaped up and he said, Nazdrovya Tovarish, Kasparov and Karpov, nose to nose, and between them, a white queen. That's, that's, that's a client. Um, this ad um, made Tommy Hilfiger famous literally in, in overnight. Uh, the day, the week, uh, a couple of days after he ran, he was on the Johnny Carson show, a, a national show. The four great American designs for men. Now, everybody knew Ralph Lauren, you know, Perry Ellis, Calvin Klein. Nobody, his mother, Tommy's mother didn't know that was him. <laughs> um, Tommy said, I can't run that ad. Uh, you know, I, you know it's, it's, it's arrogant. I said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be famous fast? You want to make it in this business? Run that ad. Anyway, he ran that ad and, uh, you know, he, uh, he became a billionaire. Uh, and, oh, and, and I also did that poster. It's on 7th Avenue. It's across the street from Calvin Klein's office. <laughs> and six months later, I, my wife and I, my beautiful wife over there, was sitting at Mr. Chow's in, in New York, having dinner with friends of ours, and Calvin Klein was at the talking to Mr. Chow at the, uh, at the we made a dean, and he's pointing, and Mr. Chow's pointing me out, and Calvin Klein comes over to me, you know, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And he sticks his hand, finger in my, and, and, and somebody said, I think my wife said, Calvin Klein's coming over here. Do you know him? I said, never met him. He comes down and he sticks his finger in my face and he says, he says, and he said, do you know it took me 20 years to get to where Tommy is today? And I grabbed his finger and I said, schmuck. Why do it in 20 years when you can do it in 20 days? Um, in your face, uh, I, I got to keep moving. Uh, in your face was a campaign that changed ESPN overnight from being a Mickey Mouse sports network to being the major network, uh, sports network in the world. I mean, I, 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 it's a two-hour talk. Um, this was a tiny year this big in the New York Times. County today, I've sat in prison 3,135 days for crime we did not commit. And it's, Ruben, it's from Ruben Hurricane Carter, numbers 45472, an ad from out of prison in the second page of New York Times. Holy shit. From a con who was supposed to have killed three white people. You know, uh, I ran that ad, picked, uh, you know, I had already lined up uh, uh, Muhammad Ali to be my chairman, and uh, I got on the phone after that ad ran. It, it, it was a national. It was all over TV and all over, you know, everybody's talking about this crazy ad coming from a con uh, in Trenton State Prison. And uh, I lined up about 100 important celebrities. And uh, f sooner or later, we got Ruben Herbert and Carter out of, uh, out of prison. He was, he was uh, committed for uh, 300 years. And that's a photograph of, um, one of our marches, and uh, that's, that's me there with my beautiful blonde wife. 
Polish American. <laughs> they know how to make chicks, I tell you. <laughs> uh, logos, um, you know, thoughtful logos. This is a, you know, a gif, you know, this is a, you know, a, 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 a lets people know that when you're on the road that you could make a kind of a U-turn and go into a, a jiffy lube. Uh, Zoom Zoom, which is a great, great a, a sausage a chain in New York back then. Um, uh, this is not the logo. This is supposed. To, the, this is a big mouth, supposedly. Don't ask me how it happened. A big. It was a big, big mouth. They, they, um, and they, they call them the big mouth of tele. I call them the big mouth of television. XNBA logo. Uh, th this is interesting because um, I, I, I was t I was talking, giving a class once at, uh, at the School of Visual Arts, the Steve Teller, and um, and uh, I was talking about how everything. There's a great idea in everything you do. There should be there's a big idea there somewhere, and I said, blah, 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 blah. and even in a even if in an architectural number for building, I said, and two days later I get a call, it was like a call from God, saying uh, we would like you to do a, a numeral a design for a numeral for a building. It was like shocking. What's the, what's the phone, what, what's the address? 20 times square. I said, oh my God, how do you do that? I did it, 20 times square. <laughs> uh, I thought I got nailed on that one. <laughs> UPI logo, obviously. Uh, this is uh, this the, uh, uh, the, uh, the award for the Art Directors Club, of the, uh, for the Hall of Fame in, in uh, that, that's the highest, uh, the highest achievement anybody could have in, uh, in, uh, as a designer or a photographer or an uh, art director is the uh, Art Directors Hall of Fame. I started it in 1972. These are super focus glasses. The name of these glasses used to be two focals. They wanted me to work on them and I said, shitty name, and I changed it to super focus. <laughs> and they really do super focus because by changing, by Using this slider, I can see from close to far. Miracle glasses. <laughs> uh, Esquire covers. Um, this was one of the first ones I did. Uh, it was um, Sonny Liston had just become champion. And uh, I showed the cover to Cassius Clay before he became Muhammad Ali. And he looked at it and he said, hey, George, that's the last motherfucker, black motherfucker America would want to see come down their chimney. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. Uh, what, the, what the covers, what was happening in America back then is liberals, what friends of mine were saying to me, hey, George, you know, maybe the guy, maybe the guy, it's gone too far, you know, uh, your Eldridge Cleaver, you know, the, uh, the Black Panthers, you know, I know we're all trying to, you know, get equal rights for, for, for blacks or for Africa, for, for Negroes, but uh, that, they're going a little too far with that stuff. So what I did is I, I just shoved, I shoved Liston wearing a Santa Claus in, in white America's face and just scared the shit out of him. Everybody understood what I was saying. I was saying, you're all full of shit, you know. Because if I was a, a young black guy back there, I would, have, I would have been a terrorist, you know, during the Jim Crow South. Uh, uh, this was a year after uh, Jack got killed at Trump Lake. Um, this was before the feminist movement, but you can smell it coming. Uh, you know, uh, they were doing an article on the masculinization of the American woman, so I figured I might as well go, I might as well have a woman shaven her chin. Um, you're all too young. Ed, Ed Sullivan, Ed Sullivan was this biggest stiff in the world. I mean, he was a stiff. Uh, he had a, he, uh, he was a, he was a, a writer you know, uh, for the New York Daily News, et cetera, a columnist, and he had this variety show. 
you know, uh, you know, he'd show, uh, he'd do, uh, he'd have a concert uh, singer, and then they'd have the Russian, you know, animals and stuff. And it was, it was the funkiest show in the world. He, uh, he but he had it, inter- but he had literally introduced um, Elvis a couple of years before. But of course, cut uh, the camera didn't show him below the hips because that was considered dirty. And one Sunday, my wife and I are at home, and, what, and, they, and he introduces the Beatles, who came. And uh, I said, oh my god, I've got to get him to, i got to get, into, I gotta get, get a, gotta do a cover with him wearing a Beatles. And someone said, well, you can do it in cover. I said, no, no it's got to be him. So I, I literally went down, I, I called the, uh, the president, uh, the, uh, the, um, the CEO, the, uh, the uh, chairman of CBS, William Paley, who always considered uh, being my mentor, because I, I started CBS, and he said, I oh, know, George, you can't make a fool out of him. I said, I'm not making a fool out of him. I'm saying the guy is hip, believe it or not. Um, anyway, he said, no, nah, no way. So I went down like an autograph seeker, and when Ed Sullivan came out of the theater, I, got, I showed him what it, what it is, and he did it like that. It's amazing what people will do to get on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> Especially back then. I mean, I could have gotten anybody to be on, uh, on Esquire cover because when I started doing the covers, they, uh, th- their circulation was like 450,000, and uh, it, we drove it up to 2 million. Uh, they were way in the red. They were in very bad shape, and they became very, very profitable. Um, the covers dramatically showed that, the, that something really exciting was going on in the, in the magazine. Um, um, I did, I, I had, I was given 100%, uh, I, I could do anything I wanted. I worked at Harold Hayes, and people said, uh, a great editor, and people say to me, boy, he had some, you, got, you had some pair of balls doing those covers, and I said, I didn't, I don't have the pair of, it was Harold Hayes. He ran them because there was, even though the magazine was building circulation like crazy and, and getting advertising like crazy, um, it, I mean, three, I mean, every four or five every year, you know, people in Congress were holding him up and saying, "How dare Esquire sit, do this?" You know, this is a college. This is a what college students thought were the greatest heroes of the day was Dylan. I did Dylan, uh, Malcolm X, Bob, uh, Jack Kennedy, and Castro. Uh, it wasn't very popular with many people. Uh, this was the way, uh, I showed the way to stay out of the, uh, out of the Vietnam War. Made, in fact, Jimi Hendrix was in the army at the time and saw this and said, to Harold Hayes, that gave him an idea. He was in the army, and he was in trouble all the time, and he acted uh, like a, uh, as if he was gay a couple of days, and they threw him out of the army. Um, did a cover that said, oh my god, we hit a little girl. Actual words coming from a, a GI in Vietnam. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you the trouble this caused. I mean, the senators, the, you know, congressmen, Screaming at Esquire, wanting to close Esquire down. How dare you say that that, that American GIs could could uh, could harm uh, you know civilians? I said, Are you shitting me? Are you are you kidding? I mean, you put young men in harm's way, they'll shoot at anything that move. You know, I was in Vietnam. I was in Korea. I saw it. Um, Hubert Humphrey. Uh, we all thought he was a great uh, uh, senator, but um, he, um, he, he let us down because when he became vice president, we thought he would pull LVJ back and, and get out of the war. So he says, I have known for 16 years his courage, his wisdom, his tact, his this, his this, and this. And then you open it up, and, uh, Hugh, and he says, you tell him, Hubert. Uh, this is reenacting. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Jack Ruby killing Oswald on television. Um, when I did this cover with Muhammad Ali, uh, he, uh, 
He was really despised by much of most of America. He was despised. He was hated by blacks because he changed from being Christian to a Muslim. He was hated by whites because he was he had a big mouth, but a beautiful big big mouth, um, and he refused to fight in a in a in a, in a terrible war. Uh, so I did a cover of him showing him as Muhammad as uh, Saint Sebastian, and it, and it combined uh, race, uh, war, and religion in one uh, striking cover. Uh, when uh, Nixon uh, was about to run for president, which shocked everybody, uh, and he had lost the, he had seemingly lost the previous election to Jack Kennedy because he looked as evil as he really was. Uh, um, this I did this cover a couple of months after Dr. King was was uh, assassinated. Um, Dr. Um, Bobby Kennedy is in the center and, and, and Jack on the left. Uh, I did Robert Kennedy's uh, 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 advertising for what he ran for the Senate in 1964, a year after Jack got killed. Um, I, Andy, I call him up, Andy, I'm going to do a cover. I want to put you on a cover of Esquire. Oh, I want to, George is going to put me on a cover of Esquire. <laughs> he, got, um, um, he said, oh, George, I know you. What, I know you. What's the idea? I said, well, Andy, I'm going to have you drowning in a giant can of, of Campbell's soup. He said, oh, I love it. <laughs> but wait a minute, George. I said, yeah. Won't you have to build a gigantic can? I said, no, schmuck. I mean, this was before, you know, I mean, this was before the, the you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the computers, but the point is, no, you take a picture of the can, you take a picture of you, and I got my birds, and oh, how clever, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's literally, you can take, it, it's a funny cover, it's a, it's a clever cover, but I had him drowning in his own celebrity. I mean, I meant it seriously. I had him, I mean, he was being swallowed by his own, and he wound up really being killed because of his own celebrity. Um, Easy Rider was the, the kind of the, the new religion for kids, so I slapped uh, Easy Rider Marquis on St. Patrick's. Oh boy, the Catholic Church was pissed at me. <laughs> I, I had to go see uh, Cardinal Cook. I swear to God I did. We discussed theology and stuff. <laughs> Um, this was an incredibly powerful cover. Uh, Lieutenant Kelly was responsible for his troops killing 500 women and children in, at, a, at a place called Mai Lai in, in, uh, in, in Vietnam. And I got him to not only sit with four children he killed, but, but smile like a, like a sniveling son of a bitch that he was. Um, the last thing I'm going to, I'm going to play a uh, music video I did uh, for uh, Bob Dylan in uh, 82. Um, and Kurt Loder of the Rolling Stones says it's still the best music video ever made. It's a six minute video. Uh, let me squeeze one more thing in. Um, everywhere I go, in America, all, all over the world, I'm called the original madman, and it's infuriating. Um, I, so uh, this, is, uh, this is for you, to understand why you hate it. You know. The buzz in town was that a great se TV series was about to premiere dealing with the ad game in the 1960s, which to me and those savvies uh, about watershed advertising and media events in American culture meant only one thing. A popular television series dealing with the explosive triggering of the legendary creative re revolution was about to be born. In the, in the 60s, the dynamic impact of ethnic, passionate and supremely talented graphic designers and copywriters had turned the ad world upside down consuming the attention of America and the world with bright, witty, entertaining advertising by creating images that caught people's eyes, penetrated their minds, warmed their hearts, and caused them to act. The creative evolution of the 1960s exposed the traditional advertising world for what they were, 
wasp-driven, hackneyed, untalented, simply put, hacks. The news of the Mad Men series was exhilarated to all of us who played prominent roles in that watershed event. But I wondered, how could they do the, do the period justice without contacting me? <laughs> the original Mad Men, for input, to consult, or whatever. And then out of the blue, a Mad Men, a Mad Men producer called me and told me they were tracking down some real Mad Men to film some promos for the show and every old time they contacted, blurted out something like, you got to get George Lois. He was the catalyst who dominated the 60s. Whoa, I said. <sighs> you mean you, that you guys are doing a TV series based on advertising the 60s and never heard of me? No, no, he protested. We know who you are. I said, bullshit, I said. <laughs> and told him that if he really wanted to know what happened in the 60s, he should read my biographical book, George, Be Careful, a Greek florist's son in the rough house world of advertising. It's a blow-by-blow -blow account of how, 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 I, of how I triggered the, the creative fucking revolution that changed the world, I said, and hung up, plenty miffed. The stunt producer called back a week later and with bated breath said, wow, we could have done a TV show just based on your book. That scene when you hung out a window and threatened to jump if the client didn't buy your matzo poster was hilarious. I told him to kiss my Greek ass and hung up. <laughs> Mad Men rip, rep, misrepresents the advertising industry by ignoring the dynamics of the creative revolution that changed the world of communications forever. In creating a popular TV show based on an ad agency, the producers went whole heart to depict the scum of the, of the industry rather than the upbeat world of culture-busting creativity. Mad Men had given the world the perception that the scatology of the Sterling Cooper workplace was industry-wide. Their maddening show was nothing more than a soap opera placed in a series at a setting of a glamorous office where stylish fools hump their appreciative coiffured secretaries, suck up martinis, and smoke themselves to death as they produce dumb, lifeless advertising, oblivious to the inspiring civil rights movement, the burgeoning women's live movement, the evil Vietnam War, and other seismic changes during the turbulent roller coaster 1960s that altered America forever. The more I think about Mad Men, the more I take the show as a personal insult. So fuck you, Mad Men. <laughs> you phony, gray flannel suit, male chauvinist, no talent, wasped, white shirted, racist, anti-Semitic, Republican sons of bitches. <laughs> Besides, when I, was, when I was in my 30s, I was better looking than John Hamm. <laughs> hey, I know. It's <laughs> Okay, yeah. I used to like Mad Men, not anymore. <laughs> well, on behalf of RGD Design Thinkers, I'd like to thank you for your inspiring and uh, just amazing session that you just it was gave a us. It's a pleasure to talk to our This is for you. <laughs>